for the BBC. BBC World News is connecting the whole of Africa through a brand new program. Our local correspondents are at the heart of what's happening right across the continent. We share their first-hand knowledge with the world and bring the world to Africa. With news, business and sport, Focus on Africa is about how Africa is today, its achievements, its aspirations and of course the challenges. Join me, Komla Dumont, for BBC Focus on Africa every weekday. Now on BBC World News, putting the important questions in the spotlight. The World Debate. Welcome to Paris and a world debate on what is the most pressing foreign policy challenge facing the world today. What to do about the ever deepening crisis in Syria. Just a short distance from here, foreign ministers and top officials from more than 70 countries have been meeting in a forum they call the Friends of Syria group. Many of them want to see outside intervention to hasten the demise of the Assad regime. But are divisions inside and outside Syria crippling efforts to bring an end to the violence? Join me, Stephen Sacker, for a vital world debate on Syria. Is it time to intervene? Welcome to the Arab World Institute in the heart of Paris, where I'm joined by activists, experts and thinkers, all of them intimately involved with the unfolding and worsening crisis in Syria. Paris has just hosted another meeting of the Friends of Syria group, and we have heard plenty of determination to do more to end the bloodshed. But what? Is military intervention an option? And if not, why not? What do Syrians want? There is much to debate here today, but before we start, I'm going to test the mood of our gathering. Would all of those who feel strongly that now is the time for some sort of military intervention, maybe limited, but military intervention, would you please raise your hands now? I have... Three. I think I'll, I'll give you more time. I'll give you more time. But let's say half a dozen people in this room think the time is now for some form of military intervention. Just to confirm the feeling, on the other side of that particular argument, raise your hands if you are quite convinced that that would be a fundamental mistake. Who believes that military intervention now would be the wrong thing? Well, clearly a majority. Some of you haven't voted, and I guess that's because you're waiting for this debate to unfold. So let's go through the arguments that underpin that very difficult question. And I'm going to begin by introducing uh, Fawaz Gerges, who is here from the Middle East Study Center of the London School of Economics, a longtime observer of Syria. Fawaz Gerges, we speak at a time when the Friends of Syria group has just finished their meeting uh, here in Paris. It appears to me that military intervention, as far as key politicians are concerned, is not a practical possibility. It's off the table. Is that the way you see it? Absolutely. I think my reading is that the likelihood of Western military intervention is very, very slim for the foreseeable future. PowerPoints. International diplomacy has been paralyzed. Security Council has been neutralized by double veto, Russian and Chinese. Barack Obama is an American president who has pledged to the American people that he will only send American troops to distant lands only when American vital interests are involved. In the eyes of the American policy establishment, American vital interests are not deeply involved in Syria. Syria, Syria is not seen as a pivotal element in the American geostrategic position. Barack Obama has been desperately trying to disengage militarily from Muslim lands. The American economy is in very much in duress. The Western powers are inward looking. Syria is seen as radically qualitatively different from Libya, that any major military intervention in Syria would require a considerable uh, military apparatus 
and a, a venture that's seen as risky and whose consequences unpredictable for Syria and the region as well. Well, thank you very much for that, that really important diplomatic overview. And you mentioned Russia there. Of course, friends of Syria meet, the Russians do not come. Is it the case that right now, Russia, in a sense, is the key player in this debate simply because it is determined to block much more muscular intervention. I'm going to bring you in, Francois Eisberg, from the uh, Institute of Strategic Studies here in Paris. Yes, Russia has been an absolutely key player in terms of providing political support, military assistance uh, to uh, the Syrian government since the rebellion began uh, nearly a year and a half ago. And Russia remains uh, the basic roadblock for an enabling resolution uh, uh, for any sort of coercive measure in the UN Security Council. What has changed, though, is that whereas, I would say, six months or a year ago, Russia had the ability, if it had wanted to, to influence the Syrian government in a way which would maybe have facilitated transition, I don't think that Russia, even Russia, has that ability today. The Bashar government uh, is essentially fighting its own battle. If the Russians were to drop the Bashar government, I don't think things would actually change very much on the ground. What could sh still change, of course, would be uh, the correlation within the UN Security Council. But uh, from what we know of current Russian and Chinese positions, uh, that uh, hypothesis remains extremely unlikely. So the politically and diplomatically enabling machinery for any form of military intervention uh, is simply not there for the moment. I confess I'm not entirely surprised that I've heard similar skepticism from two key analysts of the international diplomacy about Syria, because perhaps we should also, early in this debate, talk about morality and ethics and whether beyond what is happening in the corridors of power across the key capitals of the world there is an imperative that you see to do something to do whatever it takes to get the Assad regime out I will not leave aside the real political aspect of the problem in terms of real, of real politics it is urgent to do something. It is urgent to intervene. More and more we will wait, and more and more there will be chaos in the area. Today, the Bashar regime is a threat for the security of the area. So in terms of real, of real politics, intervention is very important, not in terms of ethics. I refuse this opposition of ethics and real politics as far as Syria is you, You've is just real. heard, if I may say so, two very respected analysts saying that in terms of real politics, you can forget it. It is not on the table. I, I don't agree with that. In terms of, I was uh, very... Uh, I, I observed very closely the Libyan intervention one year and a half ago, and I would say that in terms of real politics, it is much more doable in Syria than it was in Libya. More doable in Syria. Number one, because there is a key actor who is Turkey. Turkey is a real power belonging to the NATO and who has a personal, moral, political agenda, whatever, they want Assad out. But Number they don't two, want to undertake military action to get him out. The, they, there is some proposals of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Turkey uh, a few weeks ago about establishment of no-fly zones uh, uh, over uh, uh, Syria, which is a form of military intervention. You have the Arab League, who is much more strong, much stronger in Syria than it was about Gaddafi. The decision to have Assad out of the Arab uh, circle is much more uh, decisive than it was toward Gaddafi. So it is more doable 
well, in you, Syria than it was in Libya. You, you've thrown out a challenge there, I suspect, to many in our audience today. I want to bring in our first Syrian voice. Kamal Labwani was, until very recently, a senior figure in the Syrian National Congress. Now, I should say, we invited another senior figure from the SNC to be with us here today. There was a commitment made. That commitment has been broken. The SNC is not represented. Kamal Labwani, you left the SNC a short time ago, critical of it. But I do want you to tell me, as a senior figure uh, in the Syrian opposition, do you think that Bernard Henri Levy, the great advocate of military intervention, is right? First of all, we ask for any kind uh, can knock down this regime, any kind of intervention. But we, after one year, despaired about what happened from outside. We depend on ourselves. We need just helping from you to have the tools which we can fight with this kind of regime. We don't need your soldiers. We don't need your uh, aeroplanes. We need little uh, weapons and uh, little support. We can defeat this regime inside Syria. Just put the pressure on this regime, mixture between outside the pressure and inside the pressure. Well, I want to be clear about what you mean, because the SNC just the other day released a statement saying that they would like to see measures to stop Syrian forces bombarding rebel positions from the air. That, the implication was the SNC now wants to see a no-fly zone. I wonder whether you would support an outside imposed no-fly zone or what some people call a, a buffer zone or a no-kill zone. We can create free zone from our, by our soldiers, by our youngs, which uh, are fighting this, uh, this regime. We think there is a very uh, danger balance inside the area. If anybody intervene inside Syria, maybe we cause a, a large conflict. That's the problem. Next to you is Loy al Muqdad, who represents, uh, is very closely allied to the Free Syrian Army. Of course, fighters on the ground inside Syria. Do you believe most Syrian people now want outside help? We've just heard Mr. Labwani talking about arms, but should it go beyond the supply of weapons? We want to end this. We are now getting killed since one and a half year. 18 months, 15 months. Now we ask, we start to ask first about offline zoom. We start to ask first about safe area. No one wants to give us anything. Now on the ground, we have, we have a feeling that no one wants to help us. All of them, they left us. All the world, they left us. Even in the United States and uh, Europe countries, we have a feeling that no one wants to help us. If, the, they, if they don't want to give us any, if they don't want to get uh, direct uh, involved, they don't want to make if, even uh, airstrike or this stuff, just we are asking about offline zone. We are asking for safe area for the soldiers, for the FSA just to get there, for the people, for the, for the soldiers' families. Let me turn now to uh, Amar Wakaf. You represent the Syrian Social Club, a grouping in London which is regarded as loyal to the Baathi Assad regime. When you hear fellow Syrians calling for outside help to topple Bashar al-Assad, what's your response? Well, the Syrian Social Club really is, is a group of people who have advocated since the very start of the crisis in Syria a regime reform rather than regime change or regime toppling. We knew that the cost would be high. And with regards to foreign intervention, especially regional intervention, we think of it as being responsible for a lot of the complication that we see at the moment on the Syrian uh, plateau. We think it is very much responsible for a lot of bloodshed that has taken place. But most importantly, and especially regional um, uh, intervention, it has been responsible uh, um, uh, for tipping the, you know, the, the balance away from the peaceful nature of the revolt, if you want to call it, in Syria and turn it into a more military one. We've seen in Egypt, for example, about a thousand people killed by the state over there and yet no one thought of carrying arms against the uh, uh, state over there. But in Syria this happened from the very first beginning, really. And we think that because Syria is in such a huge strategic, important, strategically important place, 
Everyone saw an opportunity in it and they stuck their noses into it way too early. Bernard Henri Levy, I want you to respond immediately to that. I think that uh, because Syria is in such a strategical position, the world should do something. Uh, and also for humanitarian reasons. There is no way. Six, 16,000 dead up today. S they are absolutely lonely. We are speaking of a meeting of the friends of Syria today in Paris. The only friend of Syria today, the only friend of the Syrian people is the courage of the Syrian fighters. There is no other friends. Mr. Obama is not a friend of the Syrian people. Mr. Hollande today was not a friend of the Syrian people. The only friend of the Syrian people is their poor guns and their great courage. This is the situation. And this is the situation with which we have to deal today. Yeah, uh, Francois, I spoke. Yeah, uh, I, I would disagree with the contention that because Syria is strategically so important, everybody wants to put it, their nose into it. It's exactly the opposite. Because Syria is so strategically important, outside powers have been particularly diffident about getting involved. And indeed, and on this, on this score, I would agree with Bernard-Henri Lévy, they have been too diffident. And uh, there are things which can be done short of a UN Security Council resolution, which are allowable under international law, like providing more weapons, like providing actionable intelligence, because Syria is actually a country about which outsiders know a lot. We have more intelligence on what goes on in Syria than we did about what goes on in Libya or what went on in Iraq. Uh, uh, there are things that can be done to help the Syrian rebellion, uh, which do not imply a, a, a UN Security Council but, uh, sanctioned military intervention, which is not going to happen. But Francois, I spoke, it's not one of the problems that you talk about things being done to help the Syrian rebels. The fact is there are so many different Syrian opposition groups. They look fragmented. They're often arguing amongst themselves. And I'm going to bring uh, one group, the National Democratic Council of Syria, into this debate. Farouk el Mousseri, you represent them. You are not on the same side as the SNC. You have many quarrels with them. Isn't it a problem that the no, Syrian opposition is so divided? No, it's not a bigger problem. It's normal because you cannot ask for the Syrians a nation, uh, 40 millions. They are one voice. It's normal. In any parliament, in any democracy, you have many voices. For me, I am in the opposition now. This is my 46 years in the opposition. We are not in this year. We are from 66, we are fighting against the dictature of Bashar al-Assad, Hafez al-Assad. Now, we make many conferences, we make many uh, organizations against the, the regime in Syria. You want the democracy, but what they talk now here about any intervention, it's not really the good solution. We are against any intervention in Syria, military intervention. Now, if we are a real democrat, we want that many kinds of democracy in Syria. We don't want any uh, other ideas comes from outside of Syria because we are bombing the Syrian. We don't want this, we want a solution. We proposed last year a, 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 a plain peace to take the transition in Syria with the United Con uh, Security Council. We asked to, to Assad leave the power with the election, like in every, in every country. But of course, that, that hasn't happened. And we are many months on from that, and many more deaths since you because made that Because there first are call. many interventions in Syria and uh, uh, abroad ex extensions. A dictator, uh, my, uh, sir, a dictator never leaves the power just by goodwill. This never happened in history. A dictator able of killing his own people, as Assad does, never leaves power just because there is a polite request which is made by great Democrats as you are or uh, international community. The only way to have him leaving the power is an armed struggle, a real armed struggle, yeah. either with... One at a time. And one at a time. One at a time. I wonder, Ferwes Gerges has been patiently waiting to make a point, so I'm... The question is, you say, why do regional and inter international powers try to basically intervene in Syria uh, because the Syrians can resolve their own problem. The reality is, and this is really context is very critical, 
what happened in Syria 15 months ago was a politically driven uprising. It was a peaceful uprising. Let's keep in mind is that it was Bashar al-Assad, it was the Syrian regime that imposed its own narrative, that is the brutal repression that forced thousands of Syrian patriots to basically carry arms to defend themselves. Well, and, get, final, I'll come, yeah. and finally, about, I mean, we, the big question on the table is, should the Western powers intervene militarily? As you well know, I don't need to remind Francois and all of us, war takes place by other means. The, the fundamental point behind Western strategy is that they're fighting a war by other means, an economic war, a psychological war, supporting, and this particular war has been taking place for 15 months. I mean, this particular war is also beginning to produce some results. Uh, the Syrian regime is bleeding economically. We're seeing high level defections on the part of the security and the military. I wonder very much, I mean, because- But the, if I may say so, the pressures and techniques <laughs> you are talking about have taken place alongside the killing of between 15 and 16,000 people, according to the latest estimates. Absolutely. So how long can the international community stick with those methods? I mean, I think at the heart, at the fundamental to the Western strategy is that uh, there is no concrete military option that is direct military intervention for a variety of reasons. Western powers have convinced themselves that military intervention would be counterproductive, would be very risky. It would bring about a rupture, the very survival of Syria itself is at stake. Is at stake. But, and that's why they're waging a war by other means. I mean, the economic sanctions, the, uh, sanctions, the uh, psychological uh, warfare, also the materials that are now beginning to reach the opposition. The opposition is becoming more organized, more potent in its attacks. Let's remember now, I mean, fighting spread into all over Syria, uh, 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 chaos spreading into all over Syria. The government has lost control of many areas. Uh, so uh, this is at least in how Western leaders view it, it's a matter of time that this particular war by other means would produce the right. desired results. But before, I, before I bring you in, Amar, uh, Madam, I know you were trying to make a point. I am Mrs. Midani. I'm uh, uh, president of an association here in France, and uh, I'm uh, Syrian and French. I want to ask Mr. Levy, I think the biggest joke is to see Mr. Levy caring for the killed people in Syria, since he always affirms that he is working for Israel, and, he's, uh, uh, and also uh, his, his heart is with Israel. And that's why I think he thinks that uh, Syria is a threat, because it's a well, threat, I, maybe. Well, I'm going to allow Bernard this is first to speak one. for himself. After that, yeah. I'm... I, this I, is, I let me please I don't, continue. I don't allow you to say that I work for Israel. I don't you allow... said it yourself, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I don't allow you to say that I work for Israel. You, you said it yourself. You have to this word. You, I don't allow you to say that. Now You affirm the, this no, yourself. No, no, no. What, no, I, madam, what, madam. what I affirm... Let, 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 let what Bernard Henri Levy speak for himself. ...is you, you. that since the beginning of so my you, life, I want to since 40 question. years, the only thing which I can reply to you is my heart is on the side of the suffering peoples all over the people world, with the, with the people, greatest all of respect, over Adam, the world, and today, with, with and the today, respect. the capital, today, the capital of world suffering is OMS, is Syria. That's Francois Eisberg, the, we have discussed thus far in the debate whether there is any possibility of an international military intervention. At the moment, the consensus seems to be it is not going to happen. Let's also talk about what might happen inside Syria if there were or if there is to be in the future a military intervention. Could it, could it make the violence and sectarian strife in that country worse? The longer the current situation prevails in Syria, the more polarized the situation will become. In situations of civil war in which you do not have a united opposition, Inevitably, it's the most radical elements who will take the upper hand, and that pleads very much in favor of a rapid end to what is going on, which is why, personally, I think it actually does make sense to ramp up the arms deliveries the way it happened in Afghanistan under the Soviet, under the Soviet occupation, where you also had a divided opposition, by the way, and why it makes sense, indeed, to try to give the rebels 
through these means other than war, the ability to put an end to the Bashar regime as quickly as possible. Because otherwise, what you're going to get, what you are already beginning to see, actually, is the Alawites are going to move towards the traditional territories along the Mediterranean. You will see the Christians hunker down in other places. It will become Sunni versus non-Sunni. It will be the worst possible chaos brought about by the policies of mindless repression by the Bashar regime. So, so the, the quicker this is over, the better it is. And, and indeed, in the case of Libya, a quicker intervention would probably not have resulted in some of the chaos which we, which we saw. If we had been able to do things more quickly, I, we would have had a better outcome. I want to pick up something you just said, and I want to put it to Kamal al -Labwani. You made a, a reference, a comparison with Afghanistan, putting arms into Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation. Of course, what we saw was that some of those arms ultimately ended up in the hands of Osama bin Laden and other Islamist radicals. Kamal al you have talked about your fears that the Syrian opposition is increasingly being dominated by Islamist, sometimes radical Islamist forces. How deep is your concern? I start from another point. What happened in Syria is not a crisis, a humanitarian crisis. What happened is the real revolution. Revolution changed everything. It started from the regime, political regime, and reached the economic, the society, and the culture. Hmm? We need to deconstruct everything and rebuild the area in another way. This revolution, we have to support this revolution. We have to let this revolution to eat, to reach each aims. Don't intervene to stop it, to kill it. We don't need that. We need just to support us to continue. But the, in the peaceful way, it is better. Is, if you t to talk about it as a revolution, who are the revolutionaries? And to what yes. extent are you concerned that some of the most powerful forces leading the rebellion are in your words, because you walked out of the SNC using these words, are a front for the Muslim Brotherhood and radical Islamist forces. Yes, they try to buy loyalty by uh, giving them money and weapons to buy loyalty because the revolution starts from the society. And now depend on the local groups, not partial groups. But that's this a recipe is a problem. for more bloodshed, yeah. actually. And they try to make. That's a recipe for more bloodshed. You know, give them money, give them weapons. We're not talking about stopping the violence. We're talking about increasing the violence. I think the international community should decide whether they care for the prosperity of the Syrian people more than they care about, you know, toppling the regime. It has been since day one, really, the, the main objective of the international intervention was to get rid of the regime. You know, what about the Syrian people? And the 16,000 that we, everybody is talking about, you know, half of whom are either uh, uh, servicemen and women or people no, of law no, enforcement. Well, I, don't, I don't think anybody, actually, anybody who has done body counts believes that for a moment. If you look at the documentation at the UN Human Rights Council... Well, there and are civilians who, who support the government who have been slain as well, and there is increasing evidence that Al Hula massacre uh, that happened two months ago was actually committed by Free Syrian Army uh, elements and not by the Syrian Army elements. So, so in a sense, you know, people who are saying that we need military in intervention. For example, the lady spoke about Libya. Before the military intervention in Libya, we counted hundreds of dead. After the, Libyan, after the military intervention in Libya, we counted tens of thousands of dead. You know, we have to think whether we are interested in getting rid of the regime or really ensuring the prosperity of the Syrian right. people. Uh, given what you've just said about the Assad regime and your claims about the, the, the violence and who's responsible for it, I want to bring Pierre Pichinin in because you are a Belgian academic. You've spent a lot of time visiting Syria over the last troubled 12 months and you indeed have run into trouble yourself. You were arrested, uh, spent some time in a Syrian jail. Just explain for all of us here what you have learned about the Syrian government and its current policies from your time inside the country? Yes, I was uh, three times in Syria and the last time in May I was arrested in Talqalaq. It's a, lit a small city on the border of Lebanon, uh, partly under control of the re rebels. And uh, I don't know why, because I, I, I was invited in December by the government. My articles before that time were not for Bashar al-Assad, but uh, I asked to be more comprehensive about the regime. 
but uh, this time I was arrested and transferred in Homs, and I spent one night uh, in a center of the intelligence, and it was to hell. I was, I, I can say, I was tortured because uh, uh, compared with what I saw during all the night, uh, people in a in a corridor just next uh, to the room uh, where I I, I I was handcuffed. Uh, people were cut it with knife, uh, bitten with uh, cables, sticks. Um, there, there were electrocuted burns with electricity. All tonight was really to hell. And uh, I think these tortures no, uh, are not to obtain information, but just to pressure the population. To, to obtain to, um, the end of the revolution. Um, let, let me ask you then, given what you have seen so very recently inside the country, when the Russians, for example, talk about a process which has to be a dialogue between opposition forces and the Assad regime, that the removal of Assad shouldn't be a precondition, that Assad can be and should be part of the dialogue, do you believe that's possible? Of course not, uh, never the regime uh, would try to dialogue with the opposition because um, um, for, at, we are speaking now and people are dying uh, every day in Syria, you know. Actually, I think it's um, around. And uh, what happened exactly, Russia um, tried to, to, to give some time to the regime to continue the repression as quickly as possible to, to uh, obtain the, the end of the revolution because uh, uh, let, let, me stop you, let me stop you there for a moment. We've got a lot of different Syrian representatives in our audience. I want to ask you, Syrian opponents, most of you, of the Assad regime, who amongst you is prepared, even now, for the purposes of delivering peace and stability in your country, who is prepared to talk to Assad and countenance Assad being part of Syria's future? The Syrian people. For me, we are speaking in uh, imagination. I am a, the real politic. We talk with the uh, situation in Syria. To imagine a revolution, we are now 15 months a revolution in Syria. Where is the revolution? We don't see anything. We see killing the people, killing the civilian. Now, we... But Farouk al if you would yeah. just directly address my question. Yeah. You are one of the many Syrian opposition groups. Are you prepared to talk to Assad and Assad's representatives as part of a search for peace. Exactly. You I, are? Yes. I accept to talk to, uh, with any Syrian because we are Syrian. We want to talk to the Syrians, not to the American or to the French. We Maha want to talk between Syrians in, in all democracy because the others who they defend Israel or defend the, the West this, or, or Russia because now what's happened in Syria is the same thing in Afghanistan in 79. We prepared all the powers, they attack Syria like they do in, uh, did in Afghanistan. And we, st we fight, we are not for Muslims brothers, we want the democracy, we want that our youth lives in peace. All right. We want to be like every country. All right, thank you, Mr. El Masuri. I, I want to bring this back because what we began with was a discussion about the, the, the realistic possibility or otherwise of outside intervention. And the more we see the divisions exposed within the Syrian community, arguments between Syrians about, for example, whether it is viable to imagine talking to the Assad regime as part of a search for peace, the more the mess seems to get worse. Fawiz Gergers. Ironically, only a political settlement, yes. in my opinion, will rescue Syria from, I mean, all out, all out conflict. This is really ideally the only option, but also ironically, the odds are against the political settlement because both camps, as you, we have heard, hunkering down for uh, all-out conflict. The Syrian government, what did President Assad say a few days ago? We are in a state of war and we will use all means at our disposal to do what? To win this war. There is no credible oppositional faction in Syria, basically, which will agree to sit down uh, with Assad and negotiate a settlement. So what do you have? You have an existential conflict. And that's why, regardless of what we say here, with all respect to our own views, this particular conflict will play itself out in the next year. In fact, more conflict, more bloodshed will take place in Syria till the balance of power on the ground in Syria itself will basically, particular camp will gain the upper hand. For the moment, you have a stalemate. 
neither the Assad regime nor the opposition basically has the capacity to win this particular conflict. And that's why I believe that what the international community can do, the international community is hoping to tip the balance of power in favor of the opposition by helping the opposition to unite its ranks, by providing arms to the opposition, by squeezing the Assad regime, by starving the Assad regime, and that's why this is more of a prolonged conflict as opposed to being a matter of weeks or months uh, uh, to now. Francois Eisberg. Yeah, uh, something very interesting happened a few days ago in Geneva when you had the meeting of the so-called action group. Uh, not that the action pro group produced any action, uh, but the Russians were there. Now, what did the Russians do? Well, they didn't do anything revolutionary like saying we're going to go and accept a coercive uh, UN Security Council resolution. What they, did, what they did say is that they started putting themselves into a post-Assad framework, not because, that, not because they want to hasten the end of Assad, but because they have seen the writing on the wall. And in order not to appear to be complete idiots when Bashar falls, the Russians have begun doing the baby steps of moving towards admitting the inevitable, this existential conflict. Absolutely. I mean, you're, yeah. this is really I'm a very, 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 very critical. The, 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 the Russians, by accepting yeah. the creation of a transitional executive authority, what the Russians are trying to do is to position themselves. They are also coming to realize that Assad is no longer viable. Even though there has been no qualitative shift in the Russian position, but I, the fact I is they accept a transitional right. government is a testament to the changing, the gradual changing of the Russian position. Well, have, Amar Wakaf, you've been I, wanting I to get to in. If I may just remind our audience, you speak more as an Assad loyalist, so respond to what you've just heard. Well, actually, we, in the Syrian Social Club, we kind of understand how the Syrian government thinks more than a lot of people. And this is what we have uh, understood so far. But the key issue that happened in Geneva, in my opinion, is that the international powers are talking indeed about the transitional government, but the Russians are not accepting that this is a prelude for getting rid of Assad, but actually, you know, bringing all the people together, all the opposition together, giving them guarantees, incubating the Syrian opposition with an international agreed framework, which is the Annan Plan, the Geneva, uh, uh, the Geneva Agreement, and then, at the same time, give it a few years so that the opposition develop themselves without any feel of threat. I think that's what the Russian narrative is. It's not about, it has got nothing to do. And they said very clearly that this is, has, got, has got nothing to do with getting rid of Assad. The Americans would like to interpret it like this. The French would like to do so, the British as well. Right. But the Russians clearly I, I not. I want to bring Bernard-Henri Levy back in here. I may say you have made your own views of Assad very plain during this debate, but in the interests of pursuing the most rapid route to peace, are you prepared to say that elements of the Ba'athi Assad regime will have to be talked to, that the military institutions and the framework that currently exists in Syria cannot be completely dismantled if there is to be some sort of peaceful resolution of this terrible conflict? Number one, we are not at this point. The point of today is how to stop the bloodbath, how to stop the daily killings. This is the question of today. Any other speaking would be what General Mood said a few days ago, a little small talk in good hotels. That's the, that's the chief of the UN monitoring chief mission of, inside yes, Syria. He was indignated and, and in, unf infuriated by these little talks, small talks in front of the king. So number one, how to stop the killings. Number two, the question of today is that there is already a lot of people of the Assad regime making the road toward the opposition, toward the rebels. Today, General Class, this is one of the information of today. Yes, I mean, this, this, General I Class, this, I, I would like a, to a big, a, a high-ranking officer of the regime, has defected, has many did before him, and went and went to the rebellion. This is a real move. Now, of course, when the peace is established, the, with the good wisdom will be to speak with as much people as possible, as long as they don't have blood on their hands. But this will be the affair of the Syrian people. They will deal with that. Kamal Labwani. Mm. No, Kamal Labwani, I know you want to come in. Yes. 
2001, we uh, uh, established a forum for dialogue. That's why we go to prison for 10 years. That was what they called the Damascus years. Spring, I believe. Now he asked us to dialogue. We will not start a dialogue without justice. You see? Start from justice. After that, we can negotiate with, with everybody. Yes, but, but before, be clear about what you justice, mean by justice. We're not going to talk about stop killing us. Ask him, please, stop killing us. What do you want us to talk with him? We will go going to fight. We will going to fight this regime till we knock down and give, bring the Assad and in front of the court. Be, without this, we will not. We will still fighting. We are ready to to pay the blood till we reach the freedom. What this is my answer. What do you say? What do you them? say? What do you say to your fellow Syrians who, on this program, have said this is a problem that has to be sorted out by Syrians talking to Syrians, and Assad and the regime will have to be part of that? No, Assad regime will not part. Assad will leave with his gangs, and we can negotiate with the small officers. What, what about the millions of people who support him? Then what are you going to do with them? Let, let me let, 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 who support the crime is participate the crime. Yeah, well, let's let, kill on, all those let, millions. Let me, there's a lady who very patiently has been trying to get in at the back. Hind Rislan, Syrian. Actually, I want to say who decides if Mr. Assad should leave. It is the Syrian people. It is not the international community. It is not the responsibility of Mr. Levy or Hillary Clinton. That is the Syrian people who should decide. And also, I want to mention millions of Syrians went to street to support the reform program Mr. Assad announced early this year. And most of Syrian people also got the lesson from what happened in Iraq and in Libya. Even some of them who don't like Mr. Assad, but they still want him to be because he is the only guarantee for Syrian people at the moment because they are trying to keep Syria not to be another Iraq or Libya. All right. Well, Pierre Pichonet, while the lady was speaking, I know you wanted to put in a comment. So give us your comment. Yes, um, when I was on the ground uh, f from the beginning of the revolution, of course, millions of people uh, um, were in support uh, for Bashar al-Assad because they uh, saw that the regime was changing. But the election on the uh, 7th of May uh, showed that it's not the case. And now Damascus has not the same face. In, uh, in May, I saw Damascus uh, uh, very tired of this regime. No more uh, demonstration for the regime. And uh, a lot of uh, soldiers uh, near to a public building. Uh, it's not the same. The uh, things are changing now in Syria. And I, I met sometimes uh, the uh, Free Syrian Army. Everybody now asks for uh, um, an intervention, not a massive inter intervention like in, in, uh, in Libya, but uh, uh, oh, I'll, um, they need weapons, just weapons to, right. to defend the Well, you, 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 in a sense, draw us toward the close of this debate. And as I close the debate, I want to ask a very simple question. It seems, as you've just mentioned it, that a ma you, your phrase, massive intervention, as we saw in Libya, is not on the table in Syria. Bernard Henri Levy, you're very closely associated with that Libya intervention. If that is not going to happen in Syria, what do you believe are the credible next steps as this crisis unfolds? Again, two solutions. Solution number one, we help. Solution number two, we allow the people to help himself. Now, to help, there is a large scale of intervention modalities. There can be no fly zone no kill zone, uh, safe areas protected by elements of the Syrian army uh, with weapons which the uh, neighbors could deliver. There is a large game, a large possibility of, uh, of uh, intervention. It is not black and white. It is not a, a heavy intervention or nothing. The situation of today is leading Syria to a increasing chaos. And number two, the, uh, maybe Assad had support a few months ago, maybe, but today he has lost his moral legitimacy because a so. dictator acting like this right. loses I, his legitimacy I, 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 and is having I, less I, and I, less I, support. Fawaz right. Girgis, on, on the, in the spirit of, of trying to close the debate with some thoughts, some calm thoughts yes. about where next, Fawaz Girgis. We started the debate by saying, should the international community intervene militarily or not? 
the international community is proactively intervening in Syria. Syria has become a battlefield, a war by proxy. The Syrian conflict has become organically linked to a fierce regional rivalry between Iran on the one hand and the Saudi camp on the other hand, an international rivalry between Russia and the United States. And that's why the Syrian conflict differs qualitatively from that of Libya. Not only the Security Council has been neutralized, but both the regional community and the international community are complicating the regional conflict, the Syrian conflict, and exacerbating the Syrian conflict. And that's why we ask the question, what will the Syrian people do? The very destiny of the Syrian people has become now caught in both a regional rivalry and international rivalry as well. And given that reality, Francois Eisberg, there are no good options right now. It is very hard to see much positive in this debate, frankly. But what, in your view, is the least bad, credible outcome that we can imagine now? For Bashar to leave as quickly as possible. I disagree with those who say that Bashar has absolutely no support. Bashar is generating support by trying to emphasize, by trying to intensify the, in, the sectarian nature of the conflict. He is pandering to the Alawite and Christian minorities. Uh, he is uh, uh, trying to transform this conflict, which began as an ordinary Arab Spring, and which is now threatening to turn into a Sunni versus non-Sunni conflict. That is the biggest danger today. And to uh, avoid that danger from materializing, he has to go quickly. So more weapons, more intelligence to help the rebels, more sanctions as quickly as possible. All right, Fra Francois Eisberg, I know there are more people who want to talk. And I do apologize that, unfortunately, we are out of time. We have to leave this world debate, this very passionate and heated world debate at this point. I must, of course, thank all of our speakers today for their contributions here at the Arab World Institute. I want to thank our viewers on BBC World News for watching and our listeners on BBC World Service Radio as well. But for me, Stephen Sacker, and all of the World Debate team here in Paris, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello there. The dangerous heat wave continues across North America this weekend and it's going to culminate in some severe, some strong severe thunderstorms. So the potential for damaging winds again, big hail and even the odd tornado as well.